Okay, the recording started. Welcome back to the continuation of our lecture today on Christian apologetics. So, uh, yeah, so thank you for sharing your thoughts and I'm just uh, responding to Sri Kumar's uh, comment. Uh, uh, pasta in that case, eunuchs are natural. Um, I'm not sure what was, what's meant, what, I mean, uh, what you were alluding to, but yeah, there are, okay, there, there, there are uh, people who are born with physical deformities, um, which again, it's not God, God's design, but we know, as, as we've studied earlier, um, there's a deviation from God's original design, and then uh, there's help that we, you know, medically provide or medically can provide, and uh, uh, then they uh, they are then. So I'm not sure whether you're talking about those. Uh, so Shrikma, what were you talking about? Like in in in. Uh, are you talking about the me medical conditions people are born with, or yeah. Shri Kumar is on the call, not on the call? Okay. All right, Shrikma is not on the call, so I'm not uh, at the moment, so I don't see him here. Okay. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure what Shikama was referring to in that statement. So I'm not going to try and presume something. Um, let's see. If he does come back, we will get an explanation. Um, okay. Um, let's move forward. Go ahead, Christopher. Uh, Christopher, we can't hear you. Uh, Hello? Ah, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, no, I just wanted to understand, um, um, you know, um, so are there any, uh, I mean, biblical references of, um, you know, levels of um, of sin in, you know, uh, you know, in, in the case of uh, sexual uh, uh, improp impropriety or uh, you know um, deviation or whatever um, uh, because um, you know in case uh, you know uh, an ho a homosexual requires you know in a sense special counseling um, would that also apply to uh, you know people who are uh, you know living promiscu uh, sexually uh, promiscuous uh, lives and um, the church is aware of it and that's you know they're still in that in that uh, you know uh, they're still doing it so just wanted to understand uh, you know how would uh, 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 would would a homosexual be treated differently uh, versus uh, someone who is uh, you know uh, promiscuous uh, sexually Um, the answer would, answer would be no. Uh, you know, for all all call forms of sin have to be addressed, whether it is sexual and various kinds of sexual sin, or uh, whether it's you know other kinds of behavior, like maybe stealing or lying or sowing discord or disunity, and all of these are sins, and. Uh, they have to be addressed and they're, they're equally sinful. I mean, I don't, for example, uh, which is more sinful, uh, murdering a person or hating a person. You know, in the New Testament, hate is equivalent to murder, right? Uh, what is more sinful? Committing the act of adultery or lusting after a woman in your heart. In the New Testament, Jesus put both as saying, you know, 
So uh, our approach is that, look, we want the body to be whole, healthy, and holy. And so whether it's hatred or whether it's murder, whether it's adultery or whether it's lustful thinking, we have to deal with all of it, uh, you know, as sin. And, uh, you know, we, we minister, teach, preach, minister to help people live victorious lives. So to answer your question, um, Christopher, we, we shouldn't treat any of these things differently. All treated them, uh, you know, uh, equally minister to them. But uh, we do understand that um, there are things that we don't want to pass on to other people in the sense that if a person's, you know, uh, living uh, a sexually moral life, whatever form of immorality that is, uh, others shouldn't look at that and say, okay, even I can continue living that way, right? So um, there's a point in time where we will have to draw the line and say, look, um, this cannot continue in the house of God. So we have many examples. Um, you know, First Corinthians 5, Paul tells them to deal with such sin in the church. He says, you know, you got to put that out. That means this, this man was living in immorality. And Paul says, look, as part of the discipline, you have to put him out. But if he changes, which he did, you restore him back into fellowship. So that's uh, because we don't want that people to think that, okay, we are condoning it, therefore it's okay, and others can do the same thing. No, we have to, because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. That's what Paul's explanation for us in First Corinthians 5 is. And so we need to uh, deal with that in that manner. Is that okay, Krishna? Okay. All right, Samuel, your question or your comment? Um, thank you, Pastor. I'm still uh, trying to decide whether it's a question or a comment. Uh, but I'm, I think I'm tangled a little bit in um, in 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 what I'm hearing. So. Um, especially in terms of condoning or even uh, you know, trying to help a person who uh, says or who thinks he's homosexual. Like one is, you know, I mean, one way I look at it is like, like a heterosexual man uh, can, can have sexual relationships with multiple women, but, but it's, it's a self-discipline abiding in, the word of God that I will not indulge in such thing outside my marriage, and and that's a choice, even though I can, but but because of what I believe in, I will not. So so I think uh, so in that context, uh, a person who may say like I'm I'm attracted to another man, but uh, so so that means he is claiming or in, in some ways saying like uh, my sexual preference is different uh, but I will not indulge in the act and and uh, you know I will I will uh, I will do some like I will I will you know uh, I will put myself in discipline and I will I'll probably I'm, I'm not attracted to women so I'll I just be single but I'm, I'm not given to my sexual pleasures um, and I will I'll probably live live a celebrate life uh, but but then still uh, so he's not indulging the act in, in the act of homosexuality but at the same time he is acknowledging that he is homosexual as he or she so so how i mean so is a man like let's say you know the man says like i've tried everything but i i'm i'm, I'm there by confirming that i'm a, I'm a homosexual even even though you know god does not prove it so i'm, I'm not um, I'll not indulge in the activity. So, so do we still condone him because of his declaration or because of what he has come to believe in? Uh, so that's one. Yeah, because I've heard certain pastors say, as long as you're not committing the act of sexual, you're not sleeping with the same partner, but as long as you're declaring that's okay which again doesn't feel right uh, so so it's, 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 
so similarly, you know, in, in case of transgender, a person who is not homosexual, is married to the opposite sex, but somehow believes he or she is trapped in a different gender's body and chooses to dress differently or address himself or herself differently. Um, even though, you know, so it's just the identity, like people, right? so I think, uh, if I, I feel it's getting a model, you know, if it was just, I think, con confined to sexual preference, or just marry, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it becomes simplified to make decisions and to help people. But uh, now it's, it seems to be getting a little complicated because of the identity factor coming in where people may not be committing, but maybe addressing or using like a different way to address themselves and and i see a lot you know coming like even even regular people these days uh put a he she him or sorry like he him his obliques next to their names so so things like that where where it's not the act but it's just a message that you're sending across so how, how how do we um, kind of to that. Hmm. Um, so our response is any deviation from God's design, whether it's thought, word, or deed, is wrong. So the emphasis is not just on the deed. It's whether, look, are, are we deviating from God's design in thought, word, or deed? So we can even sin in thoughts. Right? That's what the Bible tells us, you know, to think on things that are pure, righteous, true. So even if my thought is deviated from God's original design, that's wrong. Right? So any deviation from God's original design in thought, word, or deed is out of order. So that's, that's the standard. So uh, going back to the first part of what you presented, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's good that somebody's not actually engaging in the deed, but look, we need to align ourselves with God, even in thought and word. So I can't say, well, I'll, I've aligned my God, myself to God in my deed, but in my thought and word, I'm contrary to God. No, you know, we need to align ourselves to God, thought, word, and deed. So that's what we are going to uh, work towards. And that's what we should desire for, you know, and, and, and God can bring about that change in the hearts and minds of people. And in the case of uh, transgenders, um, you know, the, yeah, I'm not sure I have a complete answer, but, uh, we just have to say, look, this is God's design. Let's stay aligned to that, right? Uh, uh, celebrate the way, uh, whether you're a man or a woman, celebrate the way God made you and, 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 and grow in it. And, uh, you know, uh, stay aligned to God's design. Now, it's easier said on a call like this than in practice. But then I'm sure God will give us the wisdom, the understanding on how to work that out in practice. But as a, as a principle, our principle is we have to stay aligned to God's design in thought, word, and deed. And how we work towards it, God will give us the wisdom, the grace to do that, is how I would respond to both these uh, 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 ideas. It's clear. It's clear, Pastor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now let's move uh, to some other difficult topics. Uh, okay. Divorce. Uh, divorce. We know that, uh, you know, uh, God does not approve of divorce. Uh, God has made marriage for a lifetime. Um, and uh, you know, in marriage, there can be, you know, as people, you know, as two married people, husband and wife, they journey together. There can be difficult things happen. You know, there could be failure, moral, financial, etc. 
and 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 there there is the opportunity to forgive, bring healing, restoration. But then there are situations where divorce is permitted in Scripture. One is uh, in the case of unf uh, unfaithfulness. Uh, another case of willful desertion of an unbelieving spouse. And uh, any violation of the marriage covenant, so uh, which would include physical and emotional abuse. That means two people didn't get married or enter into a covenant for her so that they, one person could just end up abusing the other person. No, that's not that's not the covenant, right? The covenant is that you're entering into this marriage to honor each other. So in the case of physical and emotional abuse, there is a violation of the covenant uh, in that sense. And so even there, and you can see this in Malachi chapter two, you know, God says, you know, when, when you're, you're, you're covering this, your, your skirt with violence. So there is violence, when there's violence involved, then usually we, you know, the only thing, only option left is for them to end their marriage and divorce. So we understand divorce is not God's design, uh, but yet in scripture, he has, uh, when there's a violation of the covenant that you've entered into, yes, people can forgive. That's forgiveness is an option. For example, if there's unfaithfulness in the marriage, the other person has option to forgive if there is repentance and you know reconciliation. But if this you know the person is continuing to live that way, then there's nothing wrong in saying, look, the marriage covenant has been violated and God permits divorce under such situations. So you don't have to stay in that uh, marriage. If the other person has violated the covenant, either through adultery, willful desertion, or in some form of abuse that's ongoing, continuing, and that's not being rectified, remedied, then, you know, you be, be, be know that's not God's best, but then that's there's no other option but to end the marriage and divorce. And as pastors, as leaders, you know, you will face these situations. And, uh, and I've faced um, all kinds of crazy situations. Um, you know, I think perhaps the most craziest was, uh, and I'll just share this one instance and we'll, we'll move on. I'll keep asking if there are any questions, but perhaps the, the craziest was when two people, um, uh, believers got married. And uh, within the first three months, uh, you know, the girl, now both were doctors, both were medical doctors, so qualified, everything, you know, they got married. Within the first three months, the girl got her visa and left for the US, disappeared. And this was a shock. And, I, and I, this was really crazy. So just, you know, then looking back, we think that the only reason she got married was so that she could get a visa because then she could, you know, she could prove that, look, I am married, so I have to come back to India. Uh, so they gave her the visa and that's it, she left. So, you know, what do you do in a situation like that? Uh, the only option was for the man to, you know, file for a divorce, end the marriage and move on in life. But this happened within three months and I was like, whoa, you know, this just really crazy. And this is like two Christians, you know, and the lady just disappeared in the US. Um, so, you know, there are these different kinds of situations and we have to work with people and, uh, you know, we, we, we don't want to go to an extreme where divorce happens at the drop of a hat, but there are these situations where that's the only option, as we see you know, biblically, uh, either in unfaithfulness or uh, in willful desertion, which happened in the example I just mentioned, or there is uh, ongoing abuse that is harmful. 
So any questions on this subject of divorce? We know where, we, where the Bible, where we stand. We, all are, we are all in agreement. Any questions on this? Okay. Uh, Pastor, um, yeah. yeah, no, I just noticed that you have, uh, you may have addressed it, but uh, noticed that you had two question marks on the physical and emotional uh, abuse. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, I, as I understand it's not actually addressed in the Bible, but it could be, um, you know, uh, a reason for, for, uh, for filing for divorce, right? Um, mm -hmm. But how would, how would one, how would one uh, sort of, um, the physical physical abuse, I can I, maybe I can I, you know that could be sort of you know uh, easier easier to understand. But how would we sort of uh, define the emotional abuse aspect of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the reason I put it in question marks is it, it, it's not that you know just because there's one incident of a physical abuse, things have to end in divorce. No, right? There's always forgiveness, healing, so on. Emotional abuse can come in many ways. Uh, it could come through uh, verbal attacks. Mm -hmm. It could come through uh, just uh, 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 abusive control of the person. Uh, you know, okay, you shouldn't do this. You can't go out. You can't do this. You can't do that. So there may not be any physical harm to the person, but it's like, hey, the person is not able to live their life. Uh, you know, and so it, it can be harmful. Uh, and, and the reason I'm putting question marks is it's it's not you know a clearly defined thing, but that's when you know you you really look into the situation and say, look, can this be resolved? Is it just a lack of understanding, a lack of uh, relational skills that we need to bring in, or is it really something bad that's really harmful for the other person, that's destructive to the marriage, where the person doing the harm is unwilling to change, is unwilling to receive, right? Um, so, so we'll have to, you know, look at the situation, see, you know, to what degree, what, what is happening, uh, and uh, then, you know, then uh, uh, take, take, take the action. So, for example, you know, if two people are living together, husband and wife are there, but let's say the husband has just totally neglected his wife. There's no care, no love, no affection, and is he's like just you know, and is suppressing the wife completely. No freedom, uh, not providing, uh, uh, and then you know, um, in some way oppressing the wife. You know, in. Uh, uh, based on fa extended family, you know, I say in India, typical situations would be blaming the wife for not bringing enough money or blaming the wife and her extended family, all that, you know, so then that's a very oppressive environment. Um, then that's where, you know, if the husband is not willing to receive any help to change and if that marriage is not happening, you know, not being restored to what the, what, a real, what marriage is supposed to be, that's when you have to say, look, it's very harmful for the other person uh, living in a situation like that. Yeah. So it is subjective. Uh, I've put question marks there because it's we don't want to do it arbitrarily or randomly, but we have to look into the situation and, and, and see what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Anita, you know, uh, yeah, I see a comment there when people are not actively involved in a relationship. Yeah. So our, our first goal is always to see if that can be remedied, you know, and um, uh, uh, in many cases, it's uh, just uh, developing skills, uh, relational skills, you know, learning how to relate. Uh, uh, you know, again, one, one incident when two young people were married. Uh, there was no violence, but the husband was very angry. You know, I mean, he just used to flare up. Now, the, you know, uh, and, uh, 
and uh, you know he would throw things around and all of that and the, the wife was so scared and I think that marriage lasted six months because or maybe even less I don't exactly know but I, I don't think it lasted more than six months and um, the wife was so scared because the husband if he got angry he would just anything can happen now he at till that time he had not really um, at least as far as I remember he had not physically abused his wife but she was just so afraid that if he got angry maybe her life the next thing was her life would be at thing but and he had threatened things like you know they were living on a high story building he was threatening like you know uh, I will push you off the, you know, the, the, the the apartment, these kind of things, you know, and this all happened within the first few months of marriage. Eventually, she was so scared. The only thing she did, the only option was she left and she came back home to her parents, because it was all because of the anger and the fear that came around with it and the threats that were made. Now, you know, at APC here in Bangalore, we require uh, people before they get married, we we require that they go through our marriage preparation course, which is about five months long. Uh, we take them through the marriage and family manual, which I think uh, you are going through this semester, or maybe next semester. I forget, and maybe I think you're going through this semester. So we we tell them, you know, you have to finish this course. Only then we'll get you married. So we make it mandatory for them to go through this, you know, the five month course. Uh, but sometimes people don't do that. They just get married. And then problems happen and then it's like really difficult for us to try to fix it, you know, and that's what happened in this couple's case. I mean, they, they, the marriage course was available. We advised them to go through it. They didn't. And then suddenly after marriage, this whole thing happened and you know, it ended in divorce because the wife couldn't stand, stay in that relationship. But it was very sad because I was, I felt like, look, at least if they'd gone through the course, these problems would have been addressed or at least exposed and either the marriage would have been prevented or the problem would have been addressed before marriage. But sometimes, uh, you know, people don't make use of what's available to them. And this is what happened. So this is an example where there was no physical violence, but the emotional thing was so tormenting. The wife couldn't stay. She left and she was afraid for her own life because of the threats. And uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's move on to the next, I'm just trying to move forward a little bit. Abortion, okay. Yeah, we did divorce, abortion. So abortion is again a very big issue. And uh, and uh, um, we know, you know it's wrong to take the life of an unborn child. Uh, and of course, you know, in the Western world and other nations, like and especially in America, this is, like a very divisive, very, very big issue. Um, we know abortion is wrong. And, uh, but what about situations in the case of a young unmarried woman, in the case of, uh, uh, you know, uh, if somebody gets pregnant, they didn't want to, uh, there was, or maybe somebody felt it's too early in marriage or in the case of rape and, and those kinds of things. So there, there are a lot of other situations around it, right? So our goal, of course, is to save the life of the unborn child. Right? That's, that's our goal. Uh, we, we, uh, we want the life of the unborn child to be saved. But if the mother's life is at risk, of course, then and you know you have to make a choice. Whom do you want alive? Do you want the mother to die, or do you want the baby to be alive? And uh, so normally, in that case, we say, okay, yeah, you know, the mother's life is at risk. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, okay. Uh, so here again, you see, there's the whole issue of faith, right? Now we can't force people to take. Um, to choose the path of faith and you know, they have to make the choice so it, uh, situations like this and as a pastor you would face this like you know um, 
a, a couple, they are, the, the, the wife is pregnant. They've been going through the regular checkups and then the doctor gives them some news. Like, you know, example would be, well, the chi child is not, you know, something wrong with the child. Um, physically, I mean, it's, the child is not formed properly. So the doctor recommends to abort the child. That's one scenario. What would you do? Second, uh, you know, for whatever reason, the mother's life is at risk. So what what should you do? I mean, to the doctor's recommending abort the child because the mother's life is at risk. The mother will not live through the pregnancy. And what would you do, right? So these are difficult questions because no, you cannot force the couple, even if they are believers, you cannot force them to walk by faith in that situation. You can't say, well, just have faith and the baby will come out all right. Or just have faith, the mother will survive the pregnancy. Right? Now, if they choose, they choose to walk by faith, you support them. If they choose to take the doctor's advice and abort the baby, you support them. Right? So, and in my experience, I've had both happen. There have been situations where, uh, you know, uh, based on this news, uh, the doctor said, you know, the child is not well formed, you please abort. But the couple decided to go ahead with the pregnancy. So we stood with them, prayed with them, right? Uh, now the child eventually, you know, the child eventually died you know, in, within a few days, fine. But at least we didn't force them to make a choice. We just journeyed with them in faith. In other cases, couples opted to abort the baby. Okay, fine, that's your choice. Don't feel guilty about it uh, in this case because you know the doctor saw you know what was wrong, they advised and they went through the medical, uh, went according to the medical advice. We just stood with them, we don't condemn them uh, uh, for their choice uh, of abortion because there was a life-threatening situation or there was uh, medical complications involved and they chose to follow the medical advice. It's okay, we stand with them. Uh, then there are these other cases, situations where, you know, what if a woman is raped and so on. So again, we don't want to force our ideas. I mean, yes, we want to save the life of the child, but what if the woman chooses not to have the child? You know, we don't want to force truth against their will. Like we said earlier, as part of our framework, we let them make the choice. We support them and stand with them, right? Now, in these earlier cases that we mentioned, uh, of course, we want to save the life of the child. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we don't want people to just arbitrarily terminate pregnancies. Uh, we want to support, uh, we want, you know, to preserve the life of the child. We, uh, so there again, we can guide them, but we have to provide options. Uh, so if we say, okay, you, you go ahead, have the baby, oh, where we provide them options, where to provide them options, you know, how are they gonna care for the baby? What if they don't have the means to care for the baby? Yeah, you know, we'll have to uh, provide options if you're going to encourage them to, um, you know, uh, have the child and, uh, and support the child. So, well, we know abortion is wrong, uh, we will have to think of the various scenarios. Uh, we have to uh, don't force our faith on people, but journey with them in faith, as in these cases that we mentioned. And in other situations where we encourage people to go through, we need to uh, to have the child. We need to provide them with support and options to take care of the child. Uh, post delivery. Okay. So that is very quick, uh, 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 you know, uh, perspective on that. Uh, I just want to see if there are any questions, any other thoughts, or any other scenarios we need to address. Now, I know, you know, in, in the Western world, and I'm just 
thinking about America, uh, abortion is such a big issue that, uh, you know, people, the church is divided, the people are divided politically, parties and based on this whole thing. And so there's the big question of can this whole thing be legislated? Uh, you know, can you dictate moral choices based on legislation? Are, are there all these big questions, you know, and so people have been fighting over it and so on. Um, and uh, um, but at the end of the day, remember, it's a moral choice, right? Legislation can be there, but there always there always be loopholes, where people find ways to work around it. Um, but ultimately, it's a choice of the heart. So we have to work towards that and helping people understand uh, what is the right choice to make and uh, journey with them in faith, in love, you know, as they make the choice. Uh, some other issues that are becoming important and of relevance to which the church has to respond are, uh, I think, let's look at these two, uh, climate change and environment, and then genetics. So climate change and environment, you know, uh, again, here the Christian church is divided. Uh, one side, there are people who say, why are you even worried about this? Uh, this is a non-issue. Because anyway, one, uh, there are going to be new heavens and the new earth. Anyway, this planet is going to be destroyed. Uh, God is going to, you know, destroy everything with fire. So why are you worried? Why are you wasting time, money, and energy on talking about climate change and environment, it's all going to end up uh, in the fire anyway. So you have Christians and believers who are positioned that way, and they don't think climate change is a big deal, don't waste time on it, don't even talk about it, etc. The environment, climate change and the environment. On the other hand, you have people, believers, who say that, look, uh, God put us in charge of the earth. In Psalm 115, verse 16, the earth is given to the children of men. So he's made us stewards, and we are stewards of everything. We are stewards of, our nat of the natural resources. We are stewards of uh, the environment. And, uh, uh, and so even though we, we have the understanding of eschatology, that is, of what is going to happen, that there, the earth is going to be burned with fire, and there are going to be new heavens and new earth. We do believe in that. But as long as we are on the earth, we need to be responsible and good stewards of the earth. Okay. So therefore, climate change, taking care of the environment, you know, deforestation, all these kinds of things are matters of importance. We need to act. We need to take action. Uh, we need to do our part in, in taking care of our environment. So you have Christians who are positioned like that. So you have Christians on both sides. Uh, and, um, uh, and, uh, and you know, having both views. Now, personally, and this is my personal positioning, I believe uh, we have to be responsible. We have to be good stewards of the environment. Uh, God has put us in charge of the planet. Uh, uh, we have to take care of the resources that God has given to us. Uh, we have to do our part, even though we know that everything is going to be destroyed by fire. There are going to be new heavens and the new earth. God is going to do everything good. But while we are on the earth, there are my, my believers. We have to be good stewards, right? So uh, stewardship is important. Um, it's a biblical truth, uh, and we can extend it even to our planet and the environment. Uh, we do our part, uh, but we, you know, I, I don't feel the church should start fighting over each other over the matter. If we can agree and uh, you know work meaningfully on the subject, uh, that would be good. And we don't want the issue of climate change to override. Uh, the main things that the church is called to do, right? So if there are people who differ in their opinion on their perspective, it's okay. You know, I'm not going to argue and fight over it because there are more important things we're supposed to call to do as a church. Um, 
I understand climate change, but I'm not going to make that the big issue. The big issue is preaching the gospel and glorifying Jesus Christ. Is that okay? Any thoughts, any comments? Okay. The last issue, social challenge that we will need to talk about is um, about genetics, right? Um, so, as science has progressed, uh, we have uh, developed abilities, uh, not only to study uh, at, uh, you know, life at the, the level of the genes, um, but we've also developed the ability and techniques to modify the genetics, the genes, uh, work with the genetic code and so on. So we call, you know, call it gene editing and so on. So you can cut parts of the uh, DNA and then work with that and so on. Or genetic modification. Now, initially, this was being used, you know, in various ways, like you can, you know, uh, use it in agriculture uh, to genetically modify certain crops so that crops that generally grow only this kind of a weather can be adapted to grow in this kind of a weather weather conditions uh, which then you know helped uh, crop production of fruit you know production of uh, uh, fruits and vegetables and so on um, they, they could be those kinds of improvements that were made which okay people were uh, okay with some people okay with now, some people are not, but they were putting it to constructive use. You know. But then, as uh, understanding and techniques increased, uh, we said, okay, what about using gene editing to treat and heal sicknesses? So we, we understood that certain parts of the genes are connected, associated with certain kinds of diseases. So what if we go in there? and treat this disease at the level of the gene, at, at the genetic level. What do we take preventive measures, right? That means we edit so that we prevent a certain disease from happening, not only from a curative point of view, but also from a preventive point of view. Then uh, that whole idea extended to, hey, how about we can make improvements so we can create a better human being, I mean, physically by modifying the gene. So it's not just treating sickness or preventing sickness, but what if we edit to improve the kind of person that's going to happen? So we're actually, you know, modifying it to create new kinds of, uh, I would say new kinds, but people with, you know, better qualities or better physical characteristics or things like that that are defined or identified, influenced by those segments of uh, the genetic uh, code. So, so this, it, it, you know, so this, this has opened up a whole big area where, where what does the church's stand on this? Uh, does the church approve of this or is this not approved? Uh, we began with using it for general purposes, trying to improve, you know, crops and vegetation and things like that. And now we are coming into uh, trying to heal sicknesses, prevent sicknesses, and then now improve the quality of life. Uh, and so where else is this going to lead us to, right? So uh, I know we just have six minutes on this, but uh, I want to hear your thoughts. What do you think? Uh, you know, should what would be the church's response to something like this? Anyone?
Uh, yes, Pastor. I, I, I think it's, um, uh, you know, there's, there is a, there needs to be a, you know, a thin dividing line between, you know, what is, what is natural and uh, what is, you know, becomes, you know, gets into this unnatural, you know, trying to uh, create something, trying to, uh, you know, change something that is, um, that is, you know, you know comes across, uh, comes out of, you know, a, a natural process. And um, uh, definitely a, a, a creation of, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, a gene or you know something that will make make uh, a human being better i think is, is you know goes beyond a natural process um to prevent something um that's that's where that thin dividing line you know gets even more thinner i think mm. so just my initial thoughts but um just related to that um and um you know probably not 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 really uh related to you know genetics but um just wanted to also get your view on, you know, the um, the aspect of you know uh, artificial in insemination and test tube babies and all that, you know, which is again goes into this, you know, into this realm of uh, natural and unnatural sort of, you know, creating something that uh, you know outside of a, of, a, of a natural process, mm. so a test, test, you know, creation of a of a test tube baby, which has been there for some some years now. And uh, what what would be your view on that? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, just you know, in a very quick way, my thoughts, and I, I'm not saying you know this is like hundred percent biblical or something, you know, but I feel that uh, as long as we use science uh, for in a way that that is positive, that is good for us, but without overriding uh, and I, again this we don't you know, it's very hard to say you know where where does this end, where does this stop? But okay, use it for good things, right? So yeah. So whether it's uh, you know, uh, organ transplant, as Beth has mentioned, or whether it's um, uh, genetic editing in order to prevent a disease or cure a disease or find a solution. Uh, and, and, and it is working. It is people are, you know, living better and being uh, prevent or diseases are being cured through that, these, these techniques. Um, so my, my my thought is, yeah, that that's okay, right? It's fine because you are helping people. You are curing a disease. You are uh, preventing a disease. So to that extent, I personally feel comfortable using science and developing techniques and so on. But where what I'm not very comfortable with, and I, I'm just using the word comfortable because you know I, I, I can't prove any of these things with chapter and verse. I'm just giving you my perspective. Uh, but I, I am not very sure about and feel we have to be very cautious about is uh, when we are trying to generate something better. Now, again, people question why not. When you're creating a better person, you're creating, you know, example is uh, simple things like, okay, what if you can make a person of a better height by, let's say, if by default, they're going to be born at five feet. But what if you can do something to give them, you know, five, eight or six feet height, you know, if they want, you know, something or, or, or I'm just making this up. I'm just saying, you know, something that that's, they, that would be better and, or, in certain other characteristics. Uh, why not? Somebody will ask, why not? You know, you're, that person is going to have a better quality of life. Uh, so why can't we do it? The danger with that is we don't know where it will all go and where do you pause. So that's why I'm a little uncomfortable with that progression. 
but I'm perfectly fine, personally speaking, that we're using science to for constructive things, either to make something, you know, cure a disease, address a problem, uh, um, and so on. But where you know how far all of this goes is a big, big question. And 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 I guess the the issue, like what Brother Manohar has put there, is we don't want to quote unquote tamper with God's design. Uh, at the same time, we want to be able to use the knowledge we have for constructive, healthy purposes. So, uh, at this moment, uh, I, I don't think anybody, not even the scientific community, and surely not even from the church, has there been a line drawn, you know, saying this is where we should stop things. It's still in the process of debate and both the scientific community is also asking questions you know where should this go where should this stop but what i would like to point out is that you know uh, the, the article from uh, the catholic church of course is that they, they said look the church must be involved must engage in this because the church uh, uh, you know does need to have a say where do we draw the line where we stop changing God's design, but using knowledge in a very positive, constructive way. You know, so the church needs to engage and be able to help in determining this. You know, uh, so this is an area of debate, but I, I want us to think about it and you know, uh, we'll see where things go. But the church needs to have a voice and it needs to be the pillar and ground of truth, even in this area of uh, science. Okay. Um, um, so Kennedy has asked the question. Um, it used drugs. Uh, yeah, I would I would leave it to the individual Kennedy. I I you know um, I wouldn't. Uh, I. One is I haven't really thought of that, but I would uh, definitely leave it to the individual to decide, uh, you know, where that would go. Okay. All right. Um, oh yeah, test your babies. Uh, again, my thought there is, uh, you know, if we're helping a couple have a child, uh, I don't see anything wrong in that. I know it's outside of the normal process. Uh, 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 yeah, at least at this point, Christopher, and I, you know, I, I don't have a definite answer, but at this point, personally, I don't see anything wrong. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, in the news, we're reading about uh, all kinds of things. You know, it related to this area of um, uh, babies and in vitro fertilization and so on, uh, and uh, uh, we're reading a lot about it. But my 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 thing is, um, uh, okay, if if a couple has helped to have a baby, okay, you know it's fine. Um, but. Uh, uh, I haven't thought through on all, all the other ramifications. I'm just looking at it from the perspective of you helping a couple have a child. Okay, I don't see anything wrong in that. Uh, but what are the other ramifications? I think we need to think about it. Okay, uh, I know we, we've kind of gone into our break time, uh, but let's just pray and we will... Uh, Dismiss. Uh, we will we will meet again next week Thursday to kind of bring this course to a close. Can I just review everything and put things together? Uh, so we'll we'll, we'll uh, next week will be our last lecture on in in, in uh, Christian apologetics, right? Uh, so uh, 
Yeah. 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 Yeah, but so I, I like I said, I haven't you know thought through on this whole full picture on this, so I wouldn't yeah I wouldn't know for sure yeah yeah okay yeah all right let's just close in prayer uh, we will uh, bring this. Christian Apologetics course to close next week when we meet on Thursday, the 18th. Um, could somebody just pray with us and we will dismiss? Who would like to pray? All right. Maggie, to you pray, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the wisdom and understanding, Lord, that you You've given us through your Holy Spirit, Lord. And as we live in the world, Father, you give us wisdom and understanding. You give us intelligence, Lord, so that we can work with what you've created and what you've made, both for good and for, for the glory of, of your name, Lord. Mm -hmm. Even though the world might not understand it, people might not see it in the way that you, you would like it to be seen. But you give us this knowledge, you give us uh, genetics, you give us everything that you created, Lord, so that we may glorify you and we may, you may be put to use for your glory. And we pray just that you prepare our heart and give us knowledge and, and understanding, Lord, so that whenever we the time comes for us to represent you, to defend you, fear your truth, to teach people about these things, Lord, Give us wisdom, give us anointing, Lord, to be able to handle this in the way that glorify you and that points everyone to you, Jesus. Until we meet again, Lord, we pray, Father, that you be with, with us, protect us. Until next week, in your mighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so next week we will... Uh meet again for Christian apologetics and wrap things up. All right, next week will be our last uh, session on Christian apologetics. We'll wrap things up. Let's take a quick break and we will meet in the Keys to Supernatural Ministry um, next class um, shortly. Okay, God bless. Please, um, we'll take a break and meet again soon. Thank you.